First of all, I want to thank Tony for this wonderful introduction and thank him for the marvelous work, the effort he's put into this terrific conference. Now, the subject of my paper is Holocaust literature, which directly and indirectly absolves Allied leaders of culpability in the mass murder of European Jews during the Second World War. Because both Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt made undeniable, highly significant contributions to victory in World War II, they have achieved iconic stature in Western culture, giving historians and commentators great incentive to promote for them a myth of innocence. One way, of course, in which this occurs is that by uh, treating these leaders with great deference, one is uh, gaining or maintaining a certain cultural, not to mention political, legitimacy. And if one is not, then one, of course, may very likely lose it or risk it. Now, all of this is quite understandable, but it is also completely unjustified. Not all things which are understandable are justifiable. And what I would like to suggest to you is that there is, of course, a great paradox at the heart of this in terms of the career of these two leaders. If you were to tell me that Winston Churchill saved the world between the years 1940 and 1941, I would probably agree with you. But that does not cover his attitude and his activities with respect to Jews, which form a different chapter and a very disappointing chapter, revealing disappointing and very contrary chapter in his life and career. And much the same is true of Franklin Roosevelt. I wanted to mention to you, of course, that as Professor Wistridge said when he was here, one can make a very good case that Joseph Stalin also was a very important instrument of destiny in World War II. He made a tremendous contribution to the victory over Hitler, the victory over Nazis. We don't celebrate him especially because he was a terrible person, a mass murderer, among other things, and a whole host of other things which, of which we disapprove and deplore. Now, the case against Churchill and against Roosevelt, making them accomplices in the Nazi Holocaust of the Jews, arises not out of one or two actions or statements, such as, for example, why wasn't Auschwitz bombed in the latter part of 1944? Certainly not that, but out of a whole prolonged and substantial pattern of conduct by those in power. And I might also mention to you that it seems to me that Roosevelt and Churchill are particularly culpable in the Jewish tragedy because I follow here the moral precept of Immanuel Kant, and that is that one's obligation to the right uh, is, is and must be proportional to one's capacities. And the United States and Great Britain her, had more resources to help Jews, both material and moral resources, than did Stalin's Russia at the time of World War II. Now, to begin with, one of the factors generally overlooked in this matter is the question of legal and derivatively from it, presumably moral obligations of both Churchill and Roosevelt. Unlike anyone else, unlike the Soviet Union, for instance, both Great Britain and the United States had explicit, explicit, international treaty obligations toward the Jews of the world. 
These obligations were legally binding throughout the Second World War. In case of Britain, its right to rule in Palestine was based on the 1922 League of Nations mandate dedicated to the establishment of a Jewish national home as set out in the 1917 Balfour Declaration, the body of which was adopted in the mandate by the League of Nations. Of course, um, you will get more, and you will get some excellent information on this, in the paper presented at this conference in, sh in a short period of time by Dr. Tony Tankey and Professor Ed Rabin, who very capably explore this subject. In the case of the United States, and this is almost universally overlooked by writers and commentators in Holocaust literature. Uh, there are some uh, totally amazing omissions in the literature with respect to this point. There was an American treaty with Great Britain promulgated by President Calvin Coolidge on December 5, 1925, which as all American treaties do, became part of the United States law under the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution. And this treaty guaranteed to American Jews all of the rights under the 1922 League of Nations mandate and the Balfour Declaration, and which specifically provided in its Article 7 that Great Britain could not change the terms of the mandate in Palestine without United States consent. In the case of Great Britain, the Chamberlain government's white paper, so-called, of May 17, 1939, virtually demolished the British commitment to the original treaty by denying to Jews, all Jews actually, the right to purchase land in most of Palestine and limiting and even effectively cutting off Jewish immigration to Palestine after a five-year period by making it contingent on Arab approval. Winston Churchill's speech in the House of Commons, which you can look up in Hansard, on May 23, 1939, in very strong opposition to the Chamberlain White Paper, was an act of monumental duplicity on his part. Because once in office as prime minister from 1940 to 1945, his own government's policies towards Palestine and the Jews were actually much more restrictive than those envisioned in the Chamberlain White Paper. And if you ask how much more restrictive, the answer is by roughly 40% in terms of legal admissions to Palestine. Now Franklin Roosevelt, unilaterally on his own and with malice toward Jews, told the Chamberlain government in 1939 that the United States would have no serious objection, no real objection, no formal objection to their change of policy in Palestine, even though, even though he had privately told his Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, and his own State Department that he did not think the Chamberlain White Paper was consistent with Britain's League of Nations mandate obligations in Palestine. And you will find a reference to this in the memoirs of Cordell Hull after the war. At the time of World War II, there was no mechanism for forcing sovereign nations to abide by their treaty obligations. And it's questionable if, if that is the case even today. But it is also true that both of these treaties, the British Mandate of 1922 and the Anglo-American Treaty of 1925, continued formally in effect. They were not repealed until Israel's independence and the partition of 1948. 
we should note also that what the white paper was ultimately was a statement of British cabinet policy in Palestine. It was not even a law, which if you wanted to change it would require a more complicated procedure at the time in Great Britain. It was basically only a British policy statement, which meant that Winston Churchill and his government were under no obligation, no obligation to enforce it or continue it if they wanted not to continue it, and they could have discontinued its use if they so chose, um, using essentially the same formula that Chamberlain did to prom promulgate it in the first place. The idea that circumstances have changed. And how did circumstances change? Well, if they were interested in helping Jews, they might have done it because one illustration of circumstances changing was the formal declaration of December 17, 1942, in which Great Britain publicly acknowledged that Hitler was carrying out a policy of physical annihilation or extermination of the Jewish people of Europe. That would have been a substantial enough change of circumstances to say, well, we need to do something different. And of course, it was also a substantial enough change of circumstances for President Roosevelt to say to his British friends, you know, we still have this treaty on the books, and I think you should be doing a little something to help the Jews. After all, look at the declaration which we have issued. And if anyone argues, well, you know, we had to be concerned about Arab unrest in Palestine, well, President Roosevelt was very much in a position at that point to tell the British, send another 10,000 troops to Palestine and, and, and do it. And of course, at that point, that is certainly in 1942, British dependence on American help was so great that President Roosevelt could have achieved probably almost anything he wanted if he, quote, nicely asked for it. Well, that's one part of the equation, and obviously the, the declaration was of great importance. Now, looking at this record, we can also note, and we should note, that after the outbreak of World War II, both Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt totally disregarded an enormous public provocation by the Nazis. And this enormous public provocation occurred on September 17, 1940, when Hitler issued an unprecedented public decree, a decree that was aimed at no other ethnic entity during World War II. And the decree simply declared that, quote, the property of Jews shall be subject to sequestration, unquote. Now, since property involves not only money, but also such items as food, clothes, tools, and shelter, and no procedural qualifications attached to the Nazi announcement, the decree was both a gross violation of the 1907 Hague Conventions on the Laws and Customs of War, to which the United States, Great Britain, and Germany were all parties, and it was indeed a prelude, a prelude to a virtually open Nazi policy applied first in the Warsaw Ghetto, where people robbed of their possessions and means of livelihood were forced into a lawless, crowded prison where they would starve and shiver to death. No diplomatic protest was ever sent to Germany where the United States had its embassy in Berlin until December of 1941, and or later, when both Britain and the United States could still communicate, sending warnings, objections, and various other messages to the, to the Nazis through neutral channels or neutral embassies in Berlin. One of the fictions 
widely represented in much of Holocaust literature is the, is the idea that Nazi extermination policy toward Jews was not known by decision makers in the West, but among other things, as our colleague at this conference, Professor Laura Leff, has demonstrated in her very fine study, Buried by the Times, published in 2005, the New York Times alone published 1,186 items concerning Nazi treatment of Jews between 1939 and 1945. That works out to better than one story every other day for the whole duration of the war. Now, the stories may not have been on the first 10 pages, and some were not all about the Jews, but they were all there. And it's a little hard to argue that people who work for government agencies only read page one of the New York Times or only look at pictures or maybe only read the sports pages and nothing else. Now, more specifically with respect to information by actual decision makers, we have, among other items, a kind of smoking gun, if you will, in State Department diplomatic papers that were published in 1961 in Washington, D.C. And here we find a personal letter from President Franklin Roosevelt to Pope Pius XII, dated September 26, 1942, and hand delivered by the President's personal representative to the Vatican, Mr. Myron C. Taylor, with all sorts of details about Nazi murders and deportations of Jews in Poland, a reference to the camp in Belzitz, by the way, and a letter including a timeline, a timeline, of August 1942, for when this information was allegedly, allegedly, initially obtained in Washington, D.C. And also, on October 6, 1942, Prime Minister Winston Churchill was personally briefed by Mr. Taylor at a dinner in the American Embassy in London about his mission to the Vatican. By the end of 1942, whatever people may say about information and knowledge, there was obviously enough information to cause the Allies to issue a declaration, the Declaration of December 17, 1942, on behalf of 12 governments, including the United Kingdom, United States, Soviet Union, and several governments in exile. It was read in the House of Commons by Winston Churchill's Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, a man to whom he sometimes referred as my son. It defined Nazi policy toward Jews quite as clearly, quite as well, as it could be today. The key phrase was, quote, German authorities are now carrying into effect Hitler's oft-repeated intention to exterminate the Jewish people in Europe. From all the occupied countries, Jews are being transported in conditions of appalling horror and brutality to Eastern Europe. Poland, Poland has been made the principal Nazi slaughterhouse. The number of victims of these bloody cruelties is reckoned in many hundreds of thousands of entirely innocent men, women, and children. Now, the declaration threatened retribution against those involved, but it actually didn't say who was involved. And for instance, it didn't even suggest that the government of Nazi Germany and its leader might be the persons who are involved. It simply said those involved would be subject to retribution. And also what it did not do was it did not promise any assistance to the victims it did not indicate any possible interference with or opposition or obstruction to the Holocaust. It did not appeal to the peoples of Europe on behalf of the Jews, and it did not promise sanctuary or ask for sanctuary either by anyone else or offer it by the parties themselves. 
Now the question is, what was it that the Allies could have done? And what did they do once they issued this declaration? And here we certainly should keep in mind that hypoth hypotheses and counterfactual history is one thing, but facts are facts. Uh, and facts are another matter. The most basic response, of course, not subject to any constraint or control by the enemy, would have been offering refuge at least to all those Jews able to take advantage of it, never mind all the alleged shipping difficulties which were claimed by those who denied refuge to Jews. But we should also note that until the Second World War, until 1939, the policies of Britain and the United States toward Jewish escape or emigration from Nazi Germany and from countries menaced by Hitler before 1939 were generally very restrictive. They were restrictive in terms of the quota system, which was ethnically skewed in order to presumably maintain what may be called the racial profile of the United States as it existed in the 1930s. And um, an excellent uh, coverage of this subject was provided by our friend Professor Bat Ami Zucker at um, this conference. And uh, we certainly look forward to the publication of her paper. But what we should note is that these policies occurred in a context in which, A, the issue was not the extermination of the Jews yet, but still something much less extreme, that is something which could be broadly called persecution, bad treatment. And also, B, the potential host countries, including certainly the United States and Britain, suffered severe consequences of the World Depression in terms of mass unemployment. But World War II changed this whole context. The situation of the Jews on the one hand became far more dire. It was now not a question of persecution, it was a question of life and death. And on the other hand, in the potential host countries, a labor shortage replaced mass unemployment. But nevertheless, the sanctuary policies of the Allied powers after 1939 and even after 1942 continued very restrictive, and in some cases they became even more restrictive than they were before the war began. So that the declaration of December 17, 1942 had no immediate or even closely proximate effects of any sort on the immigration policies of United States or Britain. And contrary to some suggestions and hints in Holocaust literature, after, even after the establishment of the so-called WRB, the War Refugee Board by Roosevelt, in January 1944, there was no change, no change in US immigration policies. They remained as restrictive as they were before. The War Refugee Board did not change that. Now again, looking at what the Allies would have done, and again, with reference to Professor Zucker's uh, article, it is clear that no legislative action was required, either in Britain or the United States, to bring about considerable changes and offer a great deal of refuge to many Jews. What was at issue was administrative practice, how the consuls would administer the law, how they were ordered to administer the law and expected to administer the law. And all of this sort of conduct, administrative practice, was wholly under executive control. And it could have made a great difference, but it was never invoked, never invoked. Now, besides refuge, what other capacities to assist Jews did the Allied States possess? 
Well, one of the capacities that they possessed, especially in the United States, was tremendous financial resources incorporated in the U.S. Lend-Lease Program established in March of 1941. About $50 billion were dispersed during the war under this program to 38 national entities around the world, and all that was required was presidential certification that the disbursement of this money is serving in some way the interests of America's national defense. In today's purchasing power, that was a slush fund of close to, of close to three fourth of a trillion dollars. Now, how could that have been used? Well, I would suggest to you that money is fungible. It could have, used, it could have been used in lots of different ways. Some very simple, some more complicated, but it could have been used. For example, it could have been used to, quote, incentivize, incentivize neutral states to give Jews temporary sanctuary in places like Spain, Portugal, Turkey, or Latin America. Until the spring of 1944, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria had both diplomatic relations and transportation links to Turkey by rail and by sea. A transit visa to Turkey and a railroad or ship's ticket could get you to Turkey. If such a thing was available, lots of Jews undoubtedly would have tried to get out there in order to take advantage of it. And you might note, by the way, that during World War II, Romania shared a common border with Poland, or what remained of Poland under German occupation. Now, another way in which money could have been used, and I think should have been, was to incentivize all of the resistance movements in Europe, especially in Poland. Governments, uh, or resistance movements rather, whose governments were basically Great Britain's guests in London during World War II, and depended fundamentally on Allied generosity. Now, one very simple way in which Jews could have been helped in Poland, for example, was by making donations to an organization which was established by the Polish government underground movement in its military arm, and that organization was mentioned here, um, and that was uh, in, in, in several papers, I believe, and that was Zegota, the Council for Aid to Jews, and this was a group that was helping Jews that escaped from the ghettos or may have escaped from camps. Any, any Jews, basically, were being helped by Zegota. But the Polish underground movement did not have great resources, didn't have a lot of money. And they undoubtedly could have used a whole lot of money to do more on behalf of Jews through Zegota. But that organization received no support, no support from allied governments. Now, there were lots of other ways in which resistance movements could have been used to help Jews. They, could, they, they possessed means of doing lots of stuff that would have been very helpful, like, for instance, among other things, fact-finding. What's going on? Give them money. Let them find out. Let them bring information, including even films. What is it that the Nazis are doing in Poland? What does it look like? Well, let's, get a, let's get a picture. Maybe we could use it. And of course, in addition, rescue operations, sabotage operations, and also very importantly, possibly, recruitment of and assistance of Jews into the resistance movements themselves if that had been subsidized in some ways by the Allies. Now you can say, and we can all agree, that how well such programs might have worked is today I will grant you a hypothetical question. 
But whether anybody really tried to do this, or even seriously considered it, is not a hypothetical question. It either happened, or it didn't happen, and it didn't happen. Now, one place where such leverage would have been especially useful and important was Poland, which was under German occupation several hundred air miles away from Great Britain. But much of the Holocaust literature makes the reader think that Poland was so far away that there was no way that the Allies could make any connection with Poland. And what they overlook was that Poland was right there. Poland was around the corner. Poland was one local phone call away. The location of the Polish government in exile in London was literally only a few blocks away from Winston Churchill's headquarters in the years 1940 to 1945. And the Polish government in exile was continually connected to a very large political and military underground movement at home. And the whole thing was, of course, led successively by Prime Minister General Władysław Sikorski and later by Mr. Stanisław Mikołajczyk, all in London. But Britain and the United States were not interested in the fate of the Jews, as recently attested very brilliantly by our colleague at this conference, Professor Michael Fleming, with respect to Auschwitz in his, which is one example, in his Cambridge University Press 2014 book, Auschwitz, the Allies and the Censorship of the Holocaust. In more general ways, an analogous theme is developed over several decades by very prominent Polish political figures and even some non-Polish political figures. Among the political figures, you will find Stefan Korbonski, the political leader of the London-affiliated underground movement, who wrote at least two books dealing with this uh, problem. You will also find, of course, the memoirs of Jan Ciechanowski, Polish ambassador in Washington, DC. You will also find them in the memoirs published in 1950 in Britain by General Tadeusz Burkomorowski, the man who led the Warsaw Uprising of August and September of 1944, um, uh, who was um, uh, imprisoned by the Germans, survived the war, and recalled that he had taken a streetcar ride in Warsaw to see what was going on in the Warsaw Ghetto, was appalled by what he saw, reported it frequently to London. Nobody was interested in this story. Mm -hmm. Now, I also wanted to mention that on December 10, 1942, the Polish Minister for Foreign Affairs in London, Edward Raczynski, sent the United States and the United Kingdom official notification, and this is, mind you, seven days before the famous Declaration of 42 is issued. He sent a message to the governments of UK and US telling them that gassing, gassing, is the principal method used by the Nazis in killing the Jews of Poland. Nobody was particularly interested. And as one of our conference contributors, Professor Wojtek Rapak, so effectively and even brilliantly demonstrated in his presentation here yesterday, President Roosevelt showed no real interest in this information about the tragic fate of Polish Jews presented to him by the great Polish courier Jan Karski on July 28, 1943. All of this, of course, long after the declaration of December 17, 1942. 
And you might also, of course, refer to the excellent contribution on this matter by Professor Darius Stola. <clears throat> now, when we talk about capacity for help, we must also include in it the capacity for moral suasion, the great power of the word. And also consider what the alternative to the power of the word is. And that is silence implies consent. Silence implies consent. And the Western leaders said nothing about the Holocaust. They said nothing before the declaration of December 1742, which incidentally was, was spoken, the words were spoken by, not by one of the leaders, but by Foreign Secretary Eaton, and they said absolutely nothing about it later. I am one of the survivors who, long after the war, didn't even know that such a declaration had ever been issued because nobody had heard of it, nobody talked about it. Now, what this said to many people in Europe was that the whole Jewish problem was not worth really worrying about too much. Maybe Hitler was right, you know. I mean, he did different things. Maybe some were right, some were wrong, and maybe killing the Jews was not a bad idea. Now, it is true that in Europe it was the Nazis who designed the final solution and conducted it from beginning to end. But how about all the people that we call bystanders, as Raoul Hilberg called them? Did some of them help the Nazis round up Jews? Did some of them perhaps participate in the killings? Were many of them utterly indifferent to what is happening to the Jews? And were some of them perhaps sympathetic and possibly even willing to help? Maybe they were persuadable. Appeals by leaders to whom all of Europe looked for liberation from Nazi rule, the President of the United States and the Prime Minister of Great Britain, would have been very important. But basically, they never happened. President Roosevelt never made a single speech addressing the Holocaust during World War II, and Winston Churchill likewise did not make a single speech addressing the Holocaust in World War II. Now, if you're thinking about Stalin, Stalin's popularity in Poland was approximately that of Hitler's popularity in Poland. And any moral appeals by Stalin would have been probably regarded in the same light as moral appeals by Al Capone in the United States. Ironically, Winston Churchill's only speech, which did have something to do with Jews, occurred on November 17, 1944. And it occurred in response to the assassination of his Mideast deputy, his personal friend, as well as his personal political appointee, Walter Lord Moyne, by members of the so-called Stern Group. He made a speech chiding the Jews of Palestine, including even Jewish children, saying you better behave yourselves because if you don't, I might change my long-standing commitment to the Zionist cause. That is what Churchill said. Between 1939 and 1945, Franklin Roosevelt made no speeches concerning, concerning the situation of European Jews as is evident from the 13-volume collection of his utterances edited by his Jewish assistant and counsel, Samuel Rosenman. He made two brief references to Jews, one in his executive order establishing the so-called War Refugee Board in January 1944, and he made another brief reference in March of 1944 in a statement during Nazi roundups of Jews in Hungary. And that statement was subsequently reported on radio. But Franklin Roosevelt also held some 400 press conferences between 1939 and 1945. He did not bring up the subject of Jews even once. And he didn't bring it up at the time of the, the most obvious time, that is when the declaration of December 17th, 42 was issued when he held a press conference around that time and reporters asked him, have you got anything for us? 
He said, I don't have anything new for you. Like um, Churchill Roosevelt defined his attitude toward Jews when he essentially told Karski uh, in the interview of July 28th that the aim is to win the war. And whatever may happen to the Jews, well, it'll just happen. This statement actually, uh, or the, this position actually defined accurately Allied attitude toward the Jewish catastrophe, hands off the Holocaust. And this policy was more formally publicly defined <clears throat> by US Assistant Secretary of State Adolf Berl. In a speech in Boston on May 4th, 1943, <clears throat> in which he said, quote, nothing can be done to save Jews except by defeat of Germany. Now, this policy of hands off the Holocaust was very correctly assessed by some very high-ranking Nazis. One of them was Dr. Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's Minister of Propaganda and the Führer's confidant. On December 13, 1942, Dr. Joseph Goebbels, Nazi Minister of Propaganda, wrote in his private diary, and I will give you a citation for that, he wrote, quote, I believe that both the English and the Americans are happy that we are exterminating the Jewish riffraff, unquote. And you will find that in Louis Lochner's translation and edition of Goebbels' diaries, private diaries, published in 1948 in New York at page 241. Of course, Dr. Goebbels was well aware of the fact that neither Britain nor the United States ever protested against Nazi policies from 1939 onward uh, diplomatically, which they could have done either directly or through neutral channels, among other things. Now, the idea that the Allies did not have capacity to intervene directly, physically, and militarily on behalf of Jews on the continent of Europe is a very common theme in Holocaust literature. Practically every book says that. But it again rests on very bad premises. One of them is ignorance of European geography, and the other is also ignorance of some very basic facts about the Second World War. One of the virtual maxims of what I call the apolog apologist school is that Poland, where most of the extermination camps were located, was outside the range of Allied aircraft until the end of 1943, and that the first physical possibility of reaching targets in Poland arose only in November of 1943, when the Allies captured the Foggia airfield in southern Italy. Among authors adhering to this idea, we find Martin Gilbert, Robert Rosen, William Rubinstein, Richard Brightman and Alan Lichtman, Deborah Lipstadt, among many others. Now this is not a matter of hypothetical post facto speculation, because distances in 1942 and 1943 or 1944 were quite the same as they are in 2015. And barring a cosmic catastrophe, they will be the same in the year 2200. Distances are not subject to change and are not matters of opinion or speculation. Since none of these Holocaust writers ever bothered to look carefully at the map of Europe, they did not realize that an airplane flying from Foggia to, say, Warsaw would need to cover 802.7 miles while one flying from, say, Lowestoft in southeast England, where American Air Force bases were located, would need 811 miles, which is virtually identical. It's the same thing. Rebecca, dear friend, maybe you can put on that little, yes, yes, that is really good. As you can see here, Yep. <laughs> 
Thank you. You could figure you you, you could figure this out by um, simply uh, using a ruler to see what the distances were in one case and in the other case. And of course, in this case, if Warsaw is the target, they were virtually identical. And it is kind of interesting that if the extermination camp at Helmno was the target, it was actually closer from Southeast England than it is from Foggia. And of course, that area was available to the Allies from day one of World War II until the end of World War II, whereas Foggia, of course, was only available from November of 1943. Now, uh, now there are other such distances which you could calculate. Some of you may remember, if you were here the other day, or yesterday, in fact, that uh, uh, we talked about it uh, in our uh, uh, panel segment here. But I did want to uh, give you this website where you yourself can now find out what are the distances between places. And that website is www.worldatlas, one word, dot com. And there you can find out how far it is from one place to another. Now, um, I might mention, for instance, that it turns out that the distance from Foggia to Treblinka is 819.35 miles, but from Southeast England it is 859.54 miles, hardly a significant difference, 40 miles each way. There is a bigger difference between Auschwitz from Foggia, it's closer than from Southeast England, but even there, uh, there is an interesting uh, aspect to that problem because the American B-24 Liberator bomber had a range of over 2,800 miles with a reduced bomb load and could essentially reach, reach virtually every single conceivable location in Poland uh, the only factors, of course, were a question of what risks and costs people wanted to take if they wanted to, quote, bother about the Jews. And uh, for those who are interested in the question of airplane ranges, um, I have a recommendation, which I mentioned here the other day. I will repeat it today. Uh, all you need to do is look up Wesley Craven and James Kate. American Air Forces in World War II, published in 1955 um, uh, by the University of Chicago Press at page 207. The issue was not in capability, it was in risk, price, and ultimately interest of the Allies. Now, it is very noteworthy that even if we somehow agreed that Poland is way too far, nobody knows where Poland is, we can't get there, it's much too far for Allied air power to reach. The apologists for Allied acquiescence in the murder of the Jews are betrayed by another obvious fact. Betrayed by another obvious fact. What about all those countries and places which were very near to Allied military power? And for the sake of conceptual clarity, we can even make a concept concession and say, let us consider only activities after December 17, 1942, because that is when the Allies publicly declared that they really knew what was being done to the Jews. Well, what happened there? Did the Allies attack Nazi targets relating to the Holocaust in France, for instance? Did they attack them in Belgium? How about in Holland? How about in Italy when they were in Italy? How about the train that evacuated the Jews of Rome to Auschwitz when Allied air power was 80 miles south of, of Rome at the time. Any planes that could fly 80 miles one way? I don't know. And how about Greece in 1944, when the Allies were only 100 miles away across the Strait of Toronto? Never mind Auschwitz. How about Drancy in France? only 200 miles or less from the British coast. 
How about Westerbork in Holland, where Anne Frank was, was held? That was pretty near. Now, people who say that Poland was much too far for Britain or the United States to reach in order to help Jews, or that they lacked the transportation to ship any escaping Jews to safety, even if there were any, need to explain something. What they need to explain, among other things, is what happened to the Romanian ship Struma in February of 1944. After all, here was a ship with Jews which did manage to escape Hitler's inferno. It reached Istanbul, Turkey. There were only 700 men, women, and children on board, roughly. They wanted to go to Palestine. They might have been accommodated elsewhere. And, and Turkey was extremely patient with these people. It let the ship stay offshore for a number of weeks while the British embassy was notified and the British embassy consulted back and forth with the foreign office back home. And the best that the British could do was to tell the Turks to turn the unseaworthy ship back into the Black Sea. Tell them we don't want them. We will not accept them in any way, shape, or form. And the ship, of course, sank with all but one person lost. This story, by the way, was published in the New York Times on page 7 with a picture on February 25th, 1942. The Churchill cabinet never criticized, let alone disciplined, anybody in the foreign office who was involved in this, never really publicly said anything about it, and the Roosevelt administration was totally silent. While Lord Halifax, the British ambassador in Washington, D.C., wrote a very impudent letter to a an American uh, Zionist judge in Philadelphia telling him that basically, you know, during this war, Jews have to die for the good of the cause, or words to that effect. Although the Allied military presence on the continent of Europe until 1944 was limited to southern Italy, the preponderance of Britain and the United States in air power over Nazi Germany from the second half of 1942 onwards ranged from very substantial to overwhelming. In the three full years in which the three great allied powers fought Nazi Germany, 42, 43, and 44, aircraft production of the allies was more than five times as great as that of Nazi Germany. And even if you factor in Japan, it was still uh, overwhelmingly greater, more than three to one against what the Nazis could put together. During all of World War II, strategic bombing by the Western Allies amounted to more than 1.8 million tons of high explosives dropped on the European con continent, including Germany, hundreds of thousands of it on German communication and railroad facilities, but not one on any Nazi target associated with the extermination of the Jews. Nearly 700,000 sorties were flown by the Allies over Europe, and um, thousands of agents, according to some sources, at least 7,000 agents were sent to Europe or infiltrated Euro to Europe, but not one for the Jews of Poland or the Jews in Poland. Now, there were especially two kinds of uses of air power which did not even acquire, require a huge commitment of, of air resources, which, in other words, uh, answered the proposition, we cannot possibly spare resources from the great objective of winning the war. But while they didn't require a large number of airplanes, they would have been very helpful. And those two uses of air power were symbolic and punitive. Now, when it comes to symbolic, what did the United States do in April of 1942 when Colonel Jimmy Doolittle led 17 B-25s off the aircraft carrier Hornet for, if I can coin a phrase and you will recognize it, 30 seconds over Tokyo. You don't do much damage by 30 seconds over Tokyo, but of course it sent a message to Japan. It was a very important message. It also sent a message to America. Um, what Israel did in 1976 in the Entebbe raid was also in large part sending a message. 
Um, and um, when it comes to punitive raids, I would mention to you that in April 1943, the United States sent a few planes to gun down Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto over Bougainville in the Pacific. Very successful mission. But I would also point out to you that the commandants of Nazi extermination camps, including, for example, Auschwitz, lived opulent and wonderful lives. It never occurred to anybody to drop in on the party, so to speak, and maybe break it up a little bit. And in 1944, Adolf Eichmann and his lovely staff of 200 fellow murderers operated on a fixed schedule in a Budapest hotel for several months. And they were only 400 to 450 air miles from the Allied base in Foggia. But no one paid them a visit, and no one even contemplated paying them a visit. They were off limits. Now, as for more general military and strategic matters, we have an, exa an excellent example of the sort of ignorance which unfortunately has permeated much of the literature, and some of them was evidenced by an otherwise meritorious writer, Lucy Davidovich. She wrote an article defending Allied leaders' passivity in the New York Times on April 10, 1982, in which she defended Allied passivity toward the Holocaust by asserting that in 1942 there was, and I'm quoting, no hope for anyone in Europe under Nazi rule, unquote. And she wrote that, quote, the war in the Pacific was going badly too, unquote. Apparently she had never heard of the greatest naval victory in the history of the United States of America in the Battle of Midway between June 4th and June 7th, 1942. She did not seem aware of the great German defeat at the gates of Moscow in December of 1941, or of Field Marshal Montgomery's victory over Rommel at El Alamein in October of November of 1942. She didn't realize that American troops were landed in North Africa in November of 1942. And she was also not cognizant of the fact they, that by December of 1942, the fate of Hitler's army in Stalingrad was all but sealed, a calamitous loss, and one more reason for all the hope in the world at the conclusion of 1942. And then, of course, there was the very important date of May 12, 1943, when all Axis forces in North Africa surrendered to British and American troops. Allied convoys sailing between Gibraltar and Suez were no longer challenged by German aircraft or other Axis assets. Allied preponderance in this area at sea and in the air especially was overwhelming, and the Nazis actually evacuated the islands of Sardinia and Corsica voluntarily abandoned them in September of 1943. And there was no equivalent of the Atlantic Wall along the coast of southern France, Italy, Yugoslavia, Albania, or the Greek islands. But again, when Jews were being killed with Allied knowledge, as specifically occurred in Rome in September of 1943 with Allied knowledge, no finger was lifted in the Allied camp to do anything about it. In the face of the great Allied military preponderance in a whole variety of military assets in 1942, 1943, and 1944, we find professors Richard Brightman and Alan Lichtman in their 2013 book, FDR and the Jews, published by Harvard University Press, no less, glibly asserting that the Allies, quote, had no military means for interfering with German forces, unquote, at page 198, and, and that the United States specifically had, quote, no military capacity to do more than what it was actually doing, unquote, at page 207. The authors provided no discussion or explanation whatever of what Allied military resources were that might conceivably support such absolute, unqualified, and ultimately absurd statements. Now, speaking of how it was that the Allies could have held the Jews but didn't, you might recall then 
in October of 1944, when the Warsaw Uprising, Polish Warsaw Uprising collapsed, our good friend, Foreign Secretary Eden, got up in the House of Commons and he said that he expected, on behalf of the Allied governments, that he expected the Nazi government to treat Polish combatants surrendering to the Germans as regular combatants of war. An unmistakable warning, which was substantially heeded by the Germans, and which is related to the fact that General Borkomorowski survived the war, was able to write his memoirs in 1950, and died in London a free man in 1966. But of course, not a word was said in any way, shape, or form when Mordecai Anulevich and Pavel Frankel were leading the Jewish ghetto uprising in April and May of 1943. Nobody thought of such a thing. In fact, neither Roosevelt or Churchill said a word about the ghetto uprising. Churchill, the man who had said in 1941 that if Hitler invaded hell, he would find something positive to say about the devil. But the Jews in Warsaw ghetto in in April and May of 1943, didn't make the devil's cut, not even then. Now, finally, the argument that helping Jews was impossible because of widespread hostility to them and adverse consequences in the Middle East is, in fact, a thinly disguised assault on both logic and common sense. If anti-Semitism was the cause of Allied attitude toward Jews, it was the anti-Semitism of the leaders, not of the followers. The most obvious reason is that the universe of measures which might have helped Jews in, why, in one way or another was so wide that the sensibilities of the presumably critical constituencies did not need to be severely tested. Would it be reasonable to expect riots in Virginia, Michigan, or Idaho if a significant number of Jews were allowed entry into places in which there was no quota system but which were American territories, such as Alaska, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and the Philippines in, say, 1941. Would most Americans or Britons be upset if more Jews had been allowed entry into Palestine or Turkey or Latin America? And here I wanted to cite the work of a dear friend and great scholar in this field, Lawrence Swinebaum, who wrote a wonderful book published by Columbia University Press in 1993, and the title of the book is A Marriage of Convenience, in which he pointed out that in Poland, many anti-Semitic constituencies were very happy to see Jews go to Palestine, and the government at the time was very happy because they wanted to get rid of them, but in any case, they were quite happy and uh, they not only didn't see anything wrong in it, they thought it was the right and proper thing to do. Now I might ask you, is there a record of letters written by Franklin Roosevelt or, or Winston Churchill to the prime ministers of Canada, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, asking their help in accommodating some Jews fleeing Hitler's Europe if they felt that there was no room at home? Well, I suggest that when this list of these telegrams and letters is found, it will be displayed alongside the letter that Hitler wrote to Eichmann protesting his inhumane treatment of Jews. <laughs> now, um, again, speaking of measures that were available to the Allies, there, are there were many ways to help Jews by simply including them in measures intended for more general purposes. The assistance to European resistance movements, Yugoslav communists included, was a case in point. Jewish resistance fighters in the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943 could have been so subsumed, but Churchill and Roosevelt did not seem to notice them at all. If it was right to supply arms to Russian communists, would supplying them to Jews be publicly unacceptable? There is no doubt that anti-Semitism was a powerful force in the Western world, no doubt about that. And Nazi propaganda continually stoked it against Western leaders. But bear in mind that wartime secrecy, wartime secrecy, 
enabled these same leaders to elaborate policies and decisions concerning Jews in conditions of all but utter privacy. If they merely wanted to consider, consider helping Jews, or even merely learn more of their circumstances, the perils of offending anti-Semitic opinion were not a factor. What they might have accomplished by these things is today admittedly hypothetical. But that these lead leaders did not do this, that they did not make the effort, however, is not a hypothesis. It is nearly 70 years later a fact. Now, anti-Semitism, like various other attitudes, has many shades, varieties, and intensities. But the fact is that organized public opinion in both Britain and the United States there is civic associations, trade unions, churches, people willing to sign their names to resolutions and to attend supporting public rallies, showed substantial sympathy for the plight of the Jews and actually called upon allied governments to do more. Um, in 1944, the Republican Party platform called for the US government to support Jewish rights and entry to Palestine, and the Democrats actually had a similar platform although that didn't seem to have much impact on President Roosevelt. So the question is here, where was the opposition? Were there any public letters to the president or the prime minister urging support for the final solution? Any public rallies backing Nazi murder operations? Any petition in support of Hitler's settlement of the Jewish question? Now in the case of Franklin Roosevelt, the irony is that for many years he depended on the support of Jews for his political career. And he actually cultivated it, that support in ways which openly challenged anti-Semitic opinion in America. Roosevelt's springboard to the presidency was the governorship of the state of New York, his home state. And no Democrat could win a statewide election here without carrying New York City, where about one third of the population was Jewish. New York State was also by far the biggest prize in the Presidential Electoral College of Roosevelt's time. When Roosevelt appointed Jews to high visibility posts, such as Felix Frankfurter to the US Supreme Court, Henry Morgenthau to Treasury Secretary, Samuel Rosenman, White House Counsel, he, quote, grated, unquote, on the psyche of every American anti-Semite who read newspapers or talked to people who did. But the American electorate never really punished Roosevelt for it. Roosevelt always won his home state, and he won the presidency with 472 electoral votes out of 531 in 1932, a record 523 in 36, 449 in 1940, and his closest call came in 1944 when he won by an electoral count of 432 to 99 for Thomas C. E. Dewey. And all this happened alongside public opinion polls which said, we think the president has appointed too many Jews to public office. But nevertheless, this is what occurred. And yet, when he personally, the president, provably knew, learned and knew of the controversy surrounding his assistant secretary of state, political appointee Breckenridge Long, a man who had sabotaged Jewish immigration and ultimately actually admitted it in his private diaries, doing so quite unlawfully, Roosevelt could not bring himself to so much as switch the man's assignments within the State Department. If that may be attributed to anti-Semitism, it was certainly not the anti-Semitism of the American public. One cannot be simultaneously a friend of the Jews and also collusive in their extermination. Churchill and Roosevelt were duplicitous men. They left no record of their wartime conversations with respect to Jews. So much is clear from various sources, including the Lowenheim, Langley, and Jonas book titled Roosevelt and Churchill, Their Secret Wartime Correspondence, published in 1975. Given the December 17th, 42 declaration and the high level of Holocaust coverage, the only reason, a reasonable explanation is that the two leaders did not think that their ideas about Jews were fit for public disclosure and discussion. But certainly what people did and did not do during the Holocaust certainly defined them 
in Jewish history. Now, I wanted to say something about um, two matters. One, the question of motives. What might be the motives of the two leaders for the way in which they acted? And also, one other aspect of responsibility, which is almost universally neglected in Holocaust literature. Well, when it comes to motive, I certainly want to recommend to you the wonderful paper by one of our par participants, Dr. Raphael Medov, presented here, in which um, Dr. Medov featured an assortment of anti-Semitic remarks and actions by President Roosevelt. And he also drew our attention to Roosevelt's article in the Macon Telegraph, a Georgia newspaper on April 30th, 1925, which showed him, among other things, to be a self-confessed out-and-out racist in the way in which he talked about mingling of Japanese and European blood, and which seemed to be related to his utterly a moral activity with respect to the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, the so-called Executive Order 9066. Now, I did want to say that with respect to Jews, Roosevelt, for obvious reasons, was circumspect about what he said in public about them. So it's hard to find openly anti-Semitic statements, uh, public statements, but there was one very interesting slip-up, which I want to mention to you. And this slip-up occurred on the 17th of January, 1943, in Casablanca, ironically one month after the Allies issued their declaration about the Holocaust. And it involved a conversation between Roosevelt and a Vichy official, General Noguet, in which Roosevelt basically was, uh, take, was saying uh, that uh, the Nazis had a reasonable cause of complaint against the Jews. Now, in this statement, he did not use the word Nazis. He used the word German. But the opinions that he expressed, that the Jews allegedly controlled all the media, this, that, and everything else in Germany, to the point of saying that most, more than half of all teachers in Germany were Jews, he, he said that were views which could only be identified with the Nazi party, possibly with the Nationalist Party, which was an ally of Hitler's in elections in 1932 and 1933, but not with any mainstream German parties, not the Social Democrats, certainly not the Communist Party of Germany, certainly not the Christian Democratic or Center Party at the time, or the People's Party, or any of those parties. They were Nazi views. And uh, Roosevelt gave them uh, a kind of endorsement there. And you can look it up yourself. And it got published in State Department documents. And it was one very interesting uh, slip up. Now, in the case of Churchill, we have one other item which is very interesting. Churchill was also circumspect about what he said. And of course, as Professor Wistridge noted, and he referred to my book, Churchill did not even mention the Holocaust in the six-volume history that he wrote after the war and after the Holocaust was public knowledge. Not one word in the text of his six-volume history. But he did something else. And I'm going to ask Rebecca to show, the, um, um, show this, this thing. Now, this is very interesting because this is a, um, an article which Churchill wrote in 1920, on February 8, 1920, in the Sunday Illustrated Herald in Britain, in which he essentially used, and Martin Gilbert admits it and discusses it, but discusses it deceptively, he used, would you believe, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and accepted the general idea suggested by the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a document which most people would agree only ranks with Mein Kampf among documents of anti-Semitism in this world. And the idea in this article was that it was that the whole communist revolution in Russia was one big Jewish conspiracy, 
intended to give control to Jews and make Russia a, commun a Jewish preserve. And this article also contained an interesting idea that of all the races in the world, in modern time, guess which one is prone to the greatest evil or evil activities, evil dispositions, and so forth? And the answer is the Jews. And this was part of uh, Churchill's proposition in this article. But what I am showing you is, in a way, very interesting, because Martin Gilbert, who was knighted by the Queen, He published this in 2007 uh, in a book called Churchill and the Jews, A Lifelong Friendship, a title which I find to be uh, outrageous, but in any case, that is the title. And he uh, took this problem head on. He tried to diffuse the matter of Churchill using the protocols. So he said, he says in this book on page 44 that this is drawn on the protocols. But then he proceeds to offer the reader a page that shows what the content of Church's article was. And the beauty of this thing is that you cannot read it. You can't even read one word here. It is all smudged. Even if you were to take a double strong looking glass or whatever it is, you couldn't read anything here. All you can read is the title about struggle for the soul of the Jewish people, but as you can see, all of this, all of the rest of it is totally smudged and fudged. And Churchill wrote this article when he had already been a minister of the crown. He was 46 years of age. He never repudiated it. He actually came on later on to believe that Stalin was really not a bad guy and one could do business with him, and he certainly wasn't a real communist. The real bad guy and communist was, of course, Leon Trotsky, and these other Jews were all in cahoots with him, which is basically an anti-Semitic kind of attitude. There are five left-handed people sitting at the table, and obviously what they are about is trying to seize control for left-handers, bring in more left-handers, and eliminate anybody who is right-handed. That is certainly the perception that is offered here. So I certainly wanted to mention it to you because, you know, if you like the protocols of the elders of Zion, you are not exactly um, uh, uh, really that enamored of Jews. Now, in any case, putting all of these things aside, the last thing which I wanted to mention, and which is a great flaw in much of the Holocaust literature to this time, is what I call the issue of agency which is the question of hierarchic responsibilities. If you are the head of the corporation and you have an accountant who works for you and he is stealing, you are responsible for that in various ways. You are responsible if you know, you are responsible if he reports to you, and certainly if you appointed him, you were told about it, and so forth, stick with him and so on. Now, in the case of Churchill and Roosevelt, because of their iconic st status, this connection is generally suspended and not really pushed in Holocaust literature. And I can understand, you know, obviously there are reasons people don't want to be unpleasant. Even Raoul Hilberg didn't do this. But the point nevertheless is that this is precisely what we do in other cases. And of course, in the case of the Holocaust, this is what we do with Hitler. Do you know of any Jews who are personally killed by Hitler? or strangled, or stabbed, or starved? And the answer is, of course, you don't. But you have heard of Heydrich, and Himmler, and Eichmann, and various people of this sort. But so how come that Breckenridge Long, whose activities are known, and even somebody like Robert Rosen says this man was terribly prejudiced against Jews and discriminated against him, he's never linked to Franklin Roosevelt, as if they didn't know one another, as if they worked some separate realms. Well, he was a political appointee. He served at the president's pleasure. Is there any evidence that the president was unhappy with him? And if he were, what did he do about it? Well, he, he didn't. 
And of course, the same is true of Winston Churchill. Who was it that appointed Lord Moyne to his position as Minister for the Middle East? It was Winston Churchill. And the power of appointment, by the way, in Britain vests, is vested in the Prime Minister, not in the Cabinet. It's vested in the Prime Minister. The power of appointment and the power to, the power to hire and the power to fire. So all of these wonderful people, Lord Moyne, Lord Halifax, Anthony Eden, all these people were Winston Churchill's creatures, and they are responsible for what they did. And I wanted to mention to you that in 1946, a military tribunal sentenced Japanese General Yamashita to death. His sentence was reviewed by the US Supreme Court and affirmed, and the reason he was sentenced to death was the troops under his command did some very bad things in the Philippines. He was held accountable. Uh, in this case, accountability seems to be uh, something that the Holocaust literature so far has tended to avoid. Anyway, I think I've given you an overview of what I've been thinking. I thank you for your attention, and that does it. Thank you.